Okay, is, is that better? Okay. Then the next thing that they do is they make a complete, carefully planned three-year product plan by adding their own features and their own changes and their own improvements, things that you hadn't planned to implement for three years or only wanted to put in the proprietary version. Plus, these whiners are completely impossible to satisfy. Good enough is never good enough. They always want it to be a little bit better. They always want to fix some more bugs. They never want to leave stuff for the next release. It's just intolerable. Plus, once you get into the world of dealing with open source communities, the worst part is it becomes impossible to readily define who's a partner and who's a customer and who's a contributor because there's this big sort of blending mishmash thing and your salespeople don't know what to do and your marketing people don't know what to do and your customer relationship people don't know what to do and it's generally one big mess. But the worst part, the worst part of that open source community is they bug you all the time. They're constantly sending you email, they're constantly asking for things, they're constantly telling you things, they want you to show up at conferences and talk to them. Who's got time for that? So we looked at this set of problems and we said, if only there were some way we could get rid of this community menace once and for all. So we spent a couple of years honing a method which I was able to take with me when I left. So I now call it the Berkus, patented, patent pending actually, but don't think that means I won't enforce it. 10 step method to destroy your community. And this method is so potent that if you implement even three of the 10 steps, you are almost guaranteed not to have a single community contributor left. So let's go through our 10 steps. Now the first thing, step is nice, because it frequently uses things you had around anyway. And these are difficult tools. So obscure build systems that have never been used outside of your company before, doc systems that require per seat licensing and a secure password, uh, limited license issue trackers, where everybody has to use the same public account. I'm sure you've seen a few of these. I'm sure you have a few of these at your company. Well, turn them loose in your open source community. Guaranteed to limit contributions. Guaranteed to prevent people from contributing too much. Also, community websites, I mean, a lot of people make the mistake of saying, oh, we won't have a community website. That'll drive away the community. The problem is they tend to set up a website on their own if you do that. It's much better if you set up a website that's the official website, but that is down as often as it's up. The second tool comes from the community itself. This is a little bit of community Aikido. That is, with some practice and some psychology, you can turn the community against itself to destroy itself. And this is through what's known as poisonous people. Every community has them. That is, a few people who are there just to give you a hard time. Now, a lot of community managers and corporate liaisons and stuff regard these people as the primary cost of managing open source. But that's the wrong attitude. These people are your biggest asset because a single properly managed poisonous person can wipe out a contributor community of hundreds. Here's how it works. The first thing that happens is, when this poisonous person shows up, you as the company representative should argue with them at length and tirelessly on public community forums. Then you should use the company blog to launch polemics and denounce them in the harshest possible terms. We're talking borderline lawsuit here. If you can get sued in the process and you can afford that, that's even better. Then you should ban them from the community. But by fiat, you know, don't use any kind of community process or anything. Just you own the site, ban them. 
then they will show up in other public forums and projects that your company does not control. So you should go there and argue with them in the other forums. And then you should wait for members of the community to step forward and say this is wrong, which gives you the excuse to allow them back on the project. And then you can start it all over again. Pretty soon, if you pursue this program, there will be no one left in the community forums except you and the poisonous people. Of course, if you're trying to prevent community, it's very important to prevent documentation. So, no code documentation, no user documentation, no project documentation, no contributor documentation, no site documentation, no release documentation. Make sure that there are no useful docs at all. But if anybody asks for help, tell them to read the fucking manual. Oh, yeah, that, that's actually very helpful. That, that's, that's a later technique, but, but implemented to great success, which is that if you have to have documents, give them a restrictive proprietary license. Yeah, that's a lot of work, though. Yeah. Yes. Now, the other important thing for getting rid of your community is to make them feel excluded. So a good way to make them feel excluded is to not allow them into the decision-making process of the project. Now, if you just do this by announcement, you could maybe get in trouble with your company PR or management or whatever. So you officially have open meetings, but you have them on extremely short notice in an online forum. So you have a meeting and chat announced six hours beforehand, preferably in a time zone different from the majority of your contributors. Even better than that is you can insist on telephone meetings. This was one that we employed to great success because, of course, any telephone meeting is going to exclude a third of the world based on time zone, and on top of which a lot of people who are doing the project moonlighting, if it's during their work hours, they also can't dial into a telephone meeting, whereas they might be able to go to a chat meeting. Um, you know, And often your telephone communication systems can only take a limited number of dial-in people. So only the first 10 community members get in. And this is where the poisonous people come in. Make sure they know about the meeting first. Now the best, yeah? Well, that goes without saying, really, doesn't it? Now the best thing that you can do, of course, is that you hold your open meetings in person at your corporate headquarters. And you know, people have to be badged in, for that matter, um, 72 hours in advance. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Precisely. Now, one thing that open source contributor community types love more than anything else is lots and lots of legal paperwork. So you want to have contributor agreements. You want to have website content stuff. You want to have NDAs that they have to sign everywhere. You want to have trademark licensing terms. You want to have image licensing terms for all of your stuff. I mean, basically what you want to do is you want to talk to your CEO and say, look, I just need like three months of the corporate attorney's time. And just say, whatever you can come up with, bring it on. And then, of course, to really make this technique effective, you need to get the corporate attorney's time on an ongoing basis so that every three to six months, he can change those agreements without any notice. Uh, you know, and because the community types are not real keen about legalese, this will drive a lot of them away. Um, of course, a lot of destroying community consists of carefully selecting who your face to the community will be. Generally, this person is known as a community liaison or a community manager. And by hiring the right community manager, you can make sure that you have no community. Now, 
A good choice for that would be you find a developer in your company who has no friends, never goes out anywhere, never talks to anyone, really hates people. Make him or her the community liaison. If you don't have one of those people handy, then instead find the busiest developer at your company, the person who's already working 75 hours a week and has both management and development responsibilities, and make them the community liaison without relieving any of the other job duties. Or, if that's not convenient, you can select somebody who is a dedicated community liaison, a dedicated community manager, but is 17 levels down in the corporate hierarchy. They're basically working for a temp agency as your community liaison. Um, or as the US military likes to put it, treat them like a mushroom, keep them in the dark and feed them shit. And pretty soon they'll develop a very bad attitude which will carry over to your community. Another good choice for a community liaison is somebody who knows absolutely nothing at all about your project. For example, anybody here involved with an open source Java project? People here open open source, what, what do you, let's get a few, you know, uh, Perl projects? Something written in Perl? Right. So if you have an open source project written in Perl, you want to get a Java person to be your liaison. And then, of course, a really good technique is to let the position of liaison or manager go vacant for three or six months at a time without any explanation or preferably notice. Keep their email account alive so people keep sending stuff to them even though it won't be responded to. Another really effective technique relies on governance. Now, a lot of companies make the mistake of saying, oh, well, if we don't create any official governance for the project, then people will get discouraged and go away. I think that's very short-sighted. Companies should really learn from the United Nations that the best way to drive people away is not to not have governance, but to have governance so complicated that you can't possibly figure out how, not only can you not figure out how to participate, but you can't even figure out what it does. This is, in fact, a UN committee. I don't know what it does. I was on their website for half an hour. I couldn't figure out what it did. So this is a good model. So, so for example, if you have, like, say, a website management authorization process, it should look something like this. There should be at least 17 different steps involved. Um, that should require authorization by various people and majority vote here and a plurality there and consensus here and authorization of the corporate sponsor there and consulting with attorneys here and reading the guts of a virgin lamb, you know, for this thing. Um, and then even within that, if you're having like elected people, like a community council, the great thing is have a community council, have a big public election process and then don't give them any power at all. Um, you can frequently convert 10 or 11 contributors directly into poisonous people by that method. Um, and then on top of which, once you've set up this complicated system, make it so that it requires a super majority of everyone involved in the project plus the sign off of three corporate executives during a month with an R in it in order to make any changes. Yep. Now, we're back to psychological techniques. One of the important things to understand about open source geek psychology is that open source contributors and communities tend to attach a lot of importance to software licenses. Therefore, if you really want to, if, you're, if you've gotten this far and you still have a bunch of people hanging around and insisting on contributing stuff, then keep changing the license of your project. You know, change it from GPL to BSD, from BSD. Well, you have to be careful with those permissive licenses because it makes it too easy for somebody to fork the project on their own. So, you know, GPL to AFL to uh, CDDL. Um, of course, one of the best things that you can do, even more effective than actually changing the license, is you can spend a lot of time talking about changing the license without actually changing it. 
That has the result of driving away everybody who liked the old license without attracting anybody who likes the new license. <coughs> now, obviously because we are trying to prevent community, one of the things that you absolutely cannot allow under any circumstances is outside contributors, people who don't work for your company and whom you cannot trust. For one thing, people in the company tend to get kind of concerned when there's really good outside contributors there about their jobs. So these are your coworkers. You want to protect them. So make sure no outside contributors. Here's how you do that. So first of all, you have an internal rule, not documented anywhere, that only employees ever get commit rights on the source code repository. Then, when people in the community say, hey, I've written X, Y, and Z, why do I not have contributor stuff? Don't give them a straight answer. Be evasive. Oh, next three months after the convention, well, there's, the, there's this issue, we have this legal issue, we're sort of working it out, our source code management is licensed. Some evasive answer. Change that answer every couple of months. Then, also, in order to help you be evasive, of course, there needs to be no written rules about why or how somebody gets to be a committer. That way you can give everybody a different answer about why they're not a committer. And then finally, in order to really put the icing on the cake, take one of your internal employees who's not a coder at all, like particularly somebody in junior management who has nothing to do with the project, and, and you know, as, as a nice thing for them, give them commit rights. That'll really make any potential contributors waiting go far, far away. <laughs> that works pretty well. So let me get to the 10th technique here. The 10th technique is actually the most powerful, the most effective, and yet the easiest. And if employed correctly and consistently, actually means that you don't necessarily have to implement the other nine techniques. And to, and to show you how powerful this technique is, I'll actually demonstrate it. So we're going to demonstrate it with this next slide. Pretty powerful, isn't it? You don't actually need to do anything. The real trick is, Zen-like, to do nothing. Be silent. People want to know from the outside, want to know what's going on with the project? Be quiet. People want to know when they're going to be able to change their project page on the website? Don't answer. People want to know when they're going to get contributor status? No answer at all is even better than an evasive answer. People want to know what the legal issues around the thing are. You know, can I license this? Can I get a trademark license? Don't say no. Say nothing at all. Not only is this incredibly effective in preventing community and driving away what community you have, but it also saves you a lot of time. You know, if you have set up a separate email account for all your project mail and don't check it. What could be easier than that? So, review the 10 techniques again. Um, ways to destroy and prevent community. Difficult tools. Encourage poisonous people. Don't document anything. Closed door meetings. Legalese, legalese, legalese. A bad liaison. Obfuscate governance. Screw around with licenses. Stop outside committers and be silent. Now. When I was at Sun, we employed all of these techniques successfully. Um, of course, while Sun was a paragon uh, of preventing community, um, they were hardly the only ones. Uh, I spoke to several members of the X.org consortium um, who claimed to be 10 for 10. Um, I, and they, these techniques work for anybody. Now, of course, 
There are always the sunshiny, Pollyannic people in your company who think, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we had a community, there'd be people we could hang out with, there'd be people who liked our products, and they actually want to do a completely different program, um, very dissimilar from these 10 points. And you have to be strong, and you have to say no, and you have to work as hard as you can to prevent community because every community person you turn away now will save you that much work later. So thank you. And I wanted to allow uh, a good amount of time for questions here uh, and discussion since we have, we have some other people in the audience who have a lot of experience with preventing community. Um, so, questions? Another good way to help is uh, announce your commitment to open source and free software at the same time as announcing proprietary extensions. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good one. <laughs> Employed very successfully. Um, I was just wondering um, what the best way to deal with poisonous people is. Yeah? Oh, wow. Okay. Down, 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 down. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just wondering what the uh, best way to deal with poisonous people okay. is. So there, there are actually a number of ways to deal with poisonous people. Um, so uh, there's um, one of the first things is, you know, obviously the, the opposite of what I portrayed here, which is you need to have a lot of documented processes and structure that are fair and accessible. Because because one of your real issues with dealing with a poisonous person is, of course, if you do anything to control them, they're going to portray themselves as a victim and suck up a lot of community time that way. So you actually have to have a specific process or structure that they can be shown to be violating to make it clear that they are a poisonous person and not somebody who's being unfairly treated by the sponsor of the project. Um, and then, um, you know, and particularly to have a community process for throwing somebody out so that it's not just you as a company that are involved for a corporate sponsor project, not just the company that's involved in throwing people out, but there's an actual, like, community council or whatever that says, yes, this person is a problem. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, I'm, you know, from my perspective, and, and not every open source project agrees with this, but if you really want to deal with poisonous people, you have to understand not everybody has the right to speak on the community forums if they're not contributing, if they're, not, if they're doing the opposite of contributing. That is, at some point you do have to cancel people's subscriptions and cancel their access to the project and throw them out, because otherwise you end up with one person who's, say, sucking up 20% of the community resources in terms of online time even though they're contributing nothing. Um, so, but like I said, you need to have a process for that. Um, the, um, in some cases, where if you've already gotten a situation where you have forums that have started to get dominated by poisonous people, um, it's often, if poisonous people are dominating the conversation, it can be hard to actually just sort of excise them. So often the way to deal with that is to actually change the way that process works. Um, for example, uh, OSI had a big issue with poisonous people and license discuss. Cranks who would argue about some minute point of licensing not relevant to the current discussion pretty much forever. Um, so what they did was they moved a lot of the license discussions actually to Bugzilla, where you would have a post of a particular license or a particular clause changed to a license, and then the discussion would become a, a you know, threaded forum discussion attached to that list. And that method was equally effective in debating the merits of a particular license, while at the same time um, not providing the same sort of voice to trolls. And so, you know, it's a case of, 
I mean, because your, your average, most of your people who are, you have two major kinds of poisonous people. Um, some are the people who are just trolls. They're looking for attention. And some are people who care very strongly about a particular issue that's only tangentially related to your project. And they're using your project to express that. Um, and in either case, you know, changing the sort of format of how the discussion works means that they often don't get the soapbox they want. And so they stop being able to be effectively poisonous. More questions? Hey, Josh. Um, oops, there we go. Coffee all over the floor already. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> One side of this that you didn't cover was how corporates ought sometimes try and prevent their own employees from becoming involved in external open source projects yeah. and all the various levels of legalese and obfuscation that they put in place, be it contractually, uh, a management level, whatever it may be, to prevent you actually contributing to an external project. Yeah. And that can be particularly frustrating because sometimes it's, all you've got is a simple bug fix. You want to give it back to the community, but no, you've got to get three levels of sign off from your legal department. Or you yeah. want to actually use a project internally and as part of that, want to be able to give back. But again, it, there's all those hoops you've got to go through. Yes. What can we do in the community to encourage those employees to be more willing to step in and be involved with projects? Well, the, um, so there's, there's a couple of things. I mean, because that's, that's actually a different set of issues. Obviously, the main thrust of this presentation was to talk about projects, open source projects that are actually owned by companies, often for something that was open sourced. In the case of external open source projects, I mean, first of all, sometimes you have to understand that in a lot of cases you can't sort of win the issue of employee contributions without, um, until there's a change of management of the company. Um, I mean, for example, um, I don't think Apple is ever going to openly contribute to open source projects as long as Jobs is alive. Um, it's, you know, because that comes from the very top, is they're very restrictive about their intellectual property and, you know, and have a default deny policy within the company um, and, and therefore not open with contributions. And, and that's often the case, is that, that sort of thing. And then even in the cases where some contributions are allowed but there's a lot of paperwork, it's because if you have a company that makes a lot of money or believes they make a lot of money off of generating ideas, generating intellectual property, then they need to have the company lawyers distinguish between things that are internal inventions they could make money off of and things that ought they can't make money off of and therefore ought to be open source contributions. Um, and that takes company attorney time. Um, the only thing that you could really do to help is if you can actually get the ear of management or if you have contact with an employee who can get the ear of management is to provide them with information and presentations and that sort of thing to explain to senior management what the value of contributing to external open source projects is, what financial benefit um, or strategic benefit it offers the company, because that's what the senior manager is thinking of. They, they, don't, they don't care about, you know, moral obligation to contribute. And then there's a last bit on that where often it's much easier for them to shut you down when they realize that the external project you want to contribute to is actually owned by another commercial company effectively. So the moment you turn around and that big project you want to be involved with is actually being sponsored by a large commercial entity, the lawyers or the managers tend to turn around a lot quicker and say, we're paying you to help competitor yeah. or to help another commercial entity. Right. But, I mean, the thing is that that actually makes a certain amount of sense, and that's, that's one of the biggest issues with a corporate-controlled open source project, is that, you know, getting contributors from a company that is ostensibly a competitor with your company means a corporate negotiation, you know? I mean, for example, for open office to get contributions from IBM, required intercorporate negotiations between IBM and Sun. That's the way it works. Because if a company is sponsoring an open source project, if they're the primary sponsor of an open source project, it's primarily because they expect to achieve some financial advantage from it. And therefore, 
a company's officers from another company are only doing their duty if they're going to be wary of contributing to that project. And for that reason, if you're a low-level employee, you know, and you have the choice between working with something that is corporate sponsored, that is sponsored by a single corporation, and something that is nonprofit community owned, obviously you're going to have less trouble with a nonprofit community owned, unless the corporate sponsored project is of a friendly company or a partner. And I think that's just the reality, is companies are in business to make money. They're in business to make more money than their competition. Um, and therefore, there's always going to be corporate management issues if you're dealing with a competitor's open source project. You singled out. You singled out Sun Microsystems as a company which does all these steps and more. Yes. Can you cite one company which treats an open source project the right way? Um, well, I mean, actually, Sun has treated some open source projects the right way, for that matter. Um, it, it just depends on the project. Um, the, um, so um, companies that have done a little better than average, I would say, um, would be HP's involvement with Debian, which has been very supportive and hands-off, um, um, and understanding the fact that HP, you know, even if they're the, probably the largest corporate contributor, don't necessarily own Debian. Um, the, um, despite all of the bad PR they generate, I actually feel like Ubu uh, Canonical has done a fairly good job of balancing commercial and, um, and open source concerns with Ubuntu. Um, the, um, now, because it is a balancing act, not everybody's happy all the time. Um, but the things that people have become very incensed about Canonical doing, I have not personally seen as that unreasonable. Um, the, um, uh, I, you know, it, it actually, it's the funny thing is you really have to look at it on a company project basis because even for some companies like IBM has done very well with their contributions to Linux in terms of being a good contributor to Linux. But that's not necessarily true with all of the projects that IBM is involved in. Um, there's, there's other stuff that IBM has been involved in where they've been extremely controlling um, uh, to, the, to the great detriment of the project. So, um, so you really have to look at this. And, and in many cases, where you tend to find the best sort of corporate relationships tend to be projects that originated outside the company um, uh, because the company doesn't feel like they need to get a financial return, direct financial return on the project, and therefore you're less likely to have a bad manager getting involved. Um, in terms of things that were open sourced by... Um, corporations from internal stuff. Um, for example, I currently work with the Actuate Corporation um, who created the BERT project, which is part of Eclipse. Um, and because they were trying to avoid a lot of mistakes of overly controlling corporate sponsors, they really let the community have a lot of freedom to the point where, from a community perspective, BERT is great, but we're actually trying to pull it back and make it more of a benefit for the company because it's, it's become an incredibly popular tool without really aligning with Actuate's products very well. Um, so we're trying to align it with Actuate's products without disrupting the community. Um, I think we're doing a fairly good job on that. Um, the, um, that's a few examples. I'd probably think of more if I spent some time Googling around. I just wanted to ask uh, over here if uh, you, uh, I talked about destroying the community. Some of those things could happen very quickly. Uh, how quickly does the uh, uh, community build back up? Do you, do you have some sense of the sort of responsibility yeah, of the communities? Yeah, and that's the issue with destroying the community um, is that, yeah, you can lose half your community over a weekend. And then it will take, I mean, it's basically, it's an issue, it basically, Think of, think of working with the community, if, if you're in charge of a project, as a marriage, right? Is that you can spend 10 years building up your marriage, and then you have one affair, and it's destroyed, and if you get back together with your spouse, it takes five years before they really trust you again. That's the way it works, because a lot of it is an issue of trust. Um, yeah. I, as, as an example of that, when I was working with Sun from the community side for OpenOffice, 
um, a Sun executive on their own tried to come up with an independent deal with Apple over the Macintosh port for OpenOffice. And they did this in a way that was very, um, in, in contrast to the community Mac port effort, um, which had been an all-volunteer effort that had been asking for a lot of support from Sun that they weren't getting. Um, and this information became public unexpectedly. Um, and not only did the whole Macport effort leave the Sun-sponsored community, but they, in fact, set up a competitive fork to OpenOffice that basically set back the whole Macport effort to OpenOffice by about five years. And this took about a week to happen. So, yeah, so it really is that time scale, which is losing community happens in days or weeks. Um, uh, regaining community happens over years. Um, one of the other things that you can do to sort of prevent that sort of screwing up where you lose a lot is it's better to under-promise and over-deliver than to over-promise and under-deliver. Um, generally, outside contributors will forgive you for saying we can't do that right now. What they won't forgive you for is saying, yes, we're, yes, we're going to do that, and then saying, no, we changed our mind. Mm -hmm. So we have one more question over here. Uh, hi, uh, as someone who works for some microsystems, I'd, I'd like to say I think it's uh, up to the engineers at the bottom of the food chain, like myself, who actually interact with the community to drive the direction of the projects and the managers, because they are not, not fundamentally bad people. They don't want to get rid of the community. They just don't understand how it works. Um, so I think for people who maybe happen to work for big companies like Sun, uh, I encourage everyone to, to try and talk to their managers, explain how it works, and, and it's, it's possible to, to yeah. make a difference. And there are projects that, that yeah. don't actually do this. Don't, don't right, yeah. Steps like no, it, some stuff is, has done fairly well. I mean, actually, Sun has been one of the better supporters of x.org. Um, so, and that's what I said, it becomes a company relationship thing, is that Sun was actually contributing to people who were holding x.org together um, for, for a period. Um, and, um, and definitely for NFS um, and some of these other projects, you know, went extremely well. They were managed in a way that advanced both the interests of the public community and Sun's own products in, in a fairly good way. Um, it's mainly with Sun, it was the really big name projects that were so dramatically mismanaged. Um, and, and frequently in a way that was very repetitive. That is, the mistakes of OpenOffice were, were repeated with OpenSolaris, were repeated with MySQL. Um, uh, and um, the and like I said, that is not isolated to Sun. This is things I've seen IBM do, I've seen HP do, I've seen lots and lots of Silicon Valley startups do. Um, you know, in terms of oh, we're an open source startup, but we still want to make proprietary licensing. We still want to have exclusive control over who can make money off of our software. Um, I'd just like to make a comment because many of us have worked or are working for the corporates that do this kind of stuff. From observation over years and having worked in one such corporate, um, there is no malicious intent whatsoever, as far as I can tell. All these managers and other, the legal people, they actually mean well. They reckon they're doing a good job, they're doing the best they can, but they are following their corporate processes. And in some cases, I think the flaw might be that they don't actually understand some of the processes that they're actually stuck with them. You can't just change a corporate process because you feel like it. They are there because lots of people follow them, which means they're kind of moving straight ahead and you can't just suddenly take a left turn or a right turn. And um, that, that seems to be causing yeah. a lot of trouble. You can't just change yeah. direction in a company because there's this open source project. You can try, but you need to actually be aware of what the causes yeah. and effects are. Yeah. So but in that case, where the, where the, the, the management failure occurs, is actually at the inception of the open source project. That is, what you often have is you have a group of people, like in the case of Sun, it was always the line engineers were all hardcore and very focused on being open source and being community minded and that sort of thing. And they didn't actually have buy-in from their managers. And so they would come up against something that actually required resources or actually required legal permissions and suddenly discovered they couldn't get it. And they'd been telling the community the stuff was coming. Um, that was something I actually saw a lot. Um, and, and so, you know, and so a lot of stuff, you can, because the thing is that if you're running a company and you're about to open source a product, you can ease into it. 
Like I said, if you under-promise and over-deliver, you're a lot less likely to get in trouble. You can say, look, we're going to throw this stuff out now. We have an internal development system. We really can't open source that right. What, who is it? Who is it that actually had to convert the internal development system? We had a major project that actually had a bizarre proprietary source code management system. And the thing is, because we told people up front that this was going to be an obstacle that we might not solve for a year, it, that worked. People were willing to accept that. It's coming eventually, and we didn't promise that it was coming tomorrow. Um, yeah. So the observation I was going to make that is that I think it's more likely at any company, not just at, say, Sun, that the big name projects are the ones that are most at risk. Because those are the ones where, you know, the engineers can't just fly under the radar. They actually do need high level buy-in. And at some level, you know, I think the unfortunate thing is this is almost the wrong uh, conference speed for you to actually have this con uh, talk. I'd love for you, for example, to give this talk at, say, um, LF Collab Summit or some talk where you're, uh, some conference where there's much more likely to be the mid-level executives, because those are the ones that desperately need to understand if they really want this to work, then here are the things that you need to do. And I think, you know, for example, with Li Linux and IBM, it was the exception because the high-level executives actually got it. And that's very often not the case at many, many yeah. other companies. Yeah. No, and, and you're right. It, it tends to be the big-name projects because those are also the ones where the high-level executives are concerned about what results they're going to get. And some of your worst community disasters happen because as a side effect of internal corporate strategy changes, that is, they've all of a sudden decided a company wasn't going to be in mobile devices and they decide they are going to be in mobile devices. So this mobile project that was pure community, open source, because they never expected to make any money off of it, suddenly becomes hybrid open source proprietary without warning. Um, you know, and, and you know, like Arjun said, it's not that the executives are deliberately trying to destroy community. Um, I wouldn't say that sometimes they're trying to do good things. More of the time, they're just not thinking about it. It's not, they're thinking about making money and corporate strategy and the next quarterly meeting and the stockholders and how they're going to manage all the staff for this. Um, and the whole community concept can be particularly difficult if you're sort of traditionally trained manager because it's very hard to quantify, you know. If you're, I mean, even dealing with the companies that realize they need help, that realize they need training, like I've been dealing with Actuate, you know, they want to have a quarterly projection for how many external contributors they're going to gain. And nobody has the math and statistics for that sort of thing yet. And so they, after a while, decide they just don't want to deal with it. If they can't manage it according to traditional techniques, they just don't want to deal with it. Um, some years back at the company you may have heard of, a marketing VP asked me a one-sentence question, and that gave me cringes. And it, it could actually feature as number 11, but you might be able to fit it in somewhere. His question was, how can we leverage the community? Yeah. Right. I don't know. I mean, I think that's a perfectly legitimate question. Yeah. The, um, I, yeah, I mean, one of the things is, like I said, is, is this whole marriage concept is that you need to get through to management that it's like, that dealing, dealing with the community is like dealing with a partnership, is that you have a group of external people um, who you don't control and you have to negotiate something with. Um, and, and that if, in fact, you treat them that way, if, if executives treat, if executives treat the community like they would treat another similar sized external corporation, it tends to go a lot better to understand. They have to negotiate, they can't make arbitrary changes, you know, because a lot of these things I'm describing, changes in arbitrary thing in licenses and that sort of thing, are also things that go wrong with intercorporate partnerships. Is that one side tries to make unilateral changes, one side fails to communicate with the other, that sort of thing. <coughs> I mean, for that matter, a lot of the successful community growth stuff doesn't apply exclusively to open source. Um, as an example of a success story, I would say uh, Toyota Skion, um, with the, for those of you who, I don't know if they sell these outside of North America, these sort of little boxy microvans sold by Toyota's low-end brand Skion, 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 whatever. Um, anyway, 
Um, this was an experimental vehicle for them. It wasn't intended to be the moneymaker for that brand. It got unexpectedly popular, and it particularly got popular among the self-starting community of, of people who did aftermarket modifications of it. And in this particular case, whoever was in charge of that at Toyota in North America was really smart. Instead of trying to take control of the aftermarket modification thing, Toyota actually sponsored a national convention for people who wanted to do aftermarket modifications to this vehicle. And the result was that sales of the vehicle shot through the roof. So the executive has to understand that the idea with the community is you're giving up control, you're investing in a lot of communication and negotiation, but in return you get market exposure and you get market penetration that you couldn't get by conventional methods. Okay. I think we're out of time anyway, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank well, thank you very much.